welcome back to my channel and in this session we are going to discuss about the acromioclavicular joint motions in previous video we did study about the acromioclavicular joint and now we are going to discover the acromioclavicular joint the acromioclavicular joint motions are three rotatory ones that includes internal external rotation anterior posterior tilting or tipping movement as well as upward and downward rotation so these three motions are happening in the acromioclavicular joint and i want to tell you that acromioclavicular joint motions are a bit difficult to understand or we don't have concessive studies showing that this is the peculiar value of acromioclavicular joint range of motion that is because of the wide variations that exist between the acromioclavicular joint between individuals or between the same individuals. We discussed that in a previous session. Also because of very articular surface. This makes studies or visualization of that movement a bit tough one. Right? But we will explore here in the most easiest manner for you to understand. Acromioclavicular joint motions. As I told you, you should remember that it is ha not having a very constant value or very pe pe perfect values because studies or researches are difficult in acromioclavicular joint. And we studied in previous session that acromioclavicular joint is which type of joint? Can anyone tell? It's a plain synovial joint. Yes, it's a plain synovial joint and hence it has three rotatory and three translatory motions. What is that? It has three rotatory and three translatory motions. Before going into that, I want to tell you if anybody is watching this video for the first time before watching the previous video, kindly check on to that and check back to this video. Right? So, it is a plain synovial joint and it is a three rotatory and three translatory motions. What are the three translatory motions? Can you guess or can you remember, recollect what are the three translatory motions in the sternoclavicular joint? That same three translatory motions are seen here. That is anterior movement, corresponding posterior, medial and lateral and a superior and inferior these are the three translatory movements that are possible in the acromioclavicular joint for example if this is the acromion process and uh, here you have our clavicle what can happen over here is that it can translate in this direction superior and inferior a slight translatory movement it can translate very minimally in medial and lateral direction okay and it can translate in this direction anterior and posterior too so these are the three translatory motions that are possible in the acromioclavicular joint which is the one is the anterior and posterior translation this one the anterior posterior uh, this one the superior and the inferior translation and medial and lateral and medial translations so we have the translatory movements so superior inferior anti this one is the anti anterior posterior medial and lateral translatory movements now if we examine further we need to focus on to the rotatory movements before telling you the rotatory movements i want to tell you something that the movements in the acromioclavicular joint for example any movement in a joint we have a strategy of understanding how we study the axis we examine the plane and then we understand the movement so when you are examining the plane in this joint or axis you need to remember that like the angle complex discussions we had the acromioclavicular joint motions occur not in the cardinal plane but in oblique planes what is that the acromioclavicular joint motions do not occur in perfect cardinal plane cardinal planes means not the normal sagittal not the normal transverse not the normal frontal but slightly oblique one so slightly oblique plane that movement would be happening oblique frontal plane and oblique coronal plane 
sorry oblique coronal plane and oblique sagittal plane if the plane is oblique definitely the axis also will be oblique why is that can anybody tell in angle complex it's a triplanar movement because of the articular surface but why in this very small acromioclavicular joint which is nearly horizontal and vertical in direction and the bone is horizontal the clavicle why do we have three-dimensional motion or why we have an oblique axis of motion not three-dimensional oblique axis of movement why that is because the resting position of scapula you can just imagine you can just look at how your scapula is going to is in its resting position for example if this is the coronal plane if for example this is the frontal plane okay now you can see that your scapula is not perfectly oriented with the frontal plane like this in fact it is slightly deviated from the frontal plane like this you can everybody can visualize that our scapula is not having a perfect vertical alignment like this but it is slightly aligned in this direction so this alignment of the scapula makes a plane that is known as the plane of the scapula that is in normal position the scapula is about 30 to 40 degree away from the which plane that is the coronal plane okay from the coronal plane or frontal plane okay that is away from the coronal plane by 30 to 45 degree this axis or this plane is known as the plane of scapula what is that it is known as the plane of the scapula so the movement in the acromioclavicular joint is going to take place in the plane of scapula not in our cardinal planes if you have if you just look uh, your um, back region you can find out that if this is the thorax your scapula is not aligned like this but it is slightly oriented away from the coronal plane and not lying in the pure coronal plane and that plane is known as the plane of scapula and the movements in the acromioclavicular joint is taking place in the plane of scapula am i clear why is stress that much is that because the plane of scapula is important at the same time acromioclavicular motion axis and planes are also important so if anybody asks you what is plane of scapula it is the resting position of the scapula in which scapula is oriented away from the coronal plane by 30 to 45 degree and that particular plane in which scapula lies is known as the plane of scapula or plane of scapation Am I right? Yes. So, we saw that the plane is oblique one. Now, let us straight away head into the discussion of the motions. The first motion that I told you is internal and external rotation of the acromioclavicular joint. Internal and external rotation. Here, there is a difference. He only in this internal and external rotation, the plane is a vertical one, not an oblique one. So it is a vertical axis. The axis is a vertical one. If it is vertical axis movement, definitely the movement will be taking place in the transverse plane. Transverse plane. Transverse plane. So uh, understanding every movement, let us follow the strategy. What is the axis? It is the vertical axis. What is the plane? It is a, a transverse plane. Okay, transverse plane. So only in this particular movement of internal and external rotation, the axis is a pure vertical one. Therefore, it's a pure transverse plane movement. Now, what is the movement? What is the movement? For understanding the sternoclavicular movement, we took one reference point. What was that? Anybody can tell? That was the lateral end of the clavicle. Very good. That was the lateral end of the clavicle. And here we take the which which particular location, which bony landmark can we take for understanding the acromioclavicular joint motions? For example, you cannot, for instance, you cannot find out the movement over here in this just joint axis. You cannot find out. So you need a reference point and that reference point is the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Remember, the glenoid fossa of the scapula is going to be your reference point throughout the motions in the acromioclavicular joint.
Make clear? Throughout the motions in the acromioclavicular joint, your reference point is to be glenoid fossa. In sternoclavicular joint, it was the lateral end of the clavicle. Here, it is the glenoid fossa. With reference to the glenoid fossa, we are going to examining the movement, examine the movement of the acromioclavicular. What is shoulder internal rotation? Can you show me what is shoulder internal rotation? It's just this one. This is the external rotation. Or this is internal, this is external. And remember always the shoulder is an integrated complex. So internal rotation of the shoulder is in this direction. Internal rotation in acromioclavicular joint will not be in this direction. It will be somewhat in the same direction. Let us examine what is happening in internal rotation. And this is our acromioclavicular joint. And what happens in internal rotation? You have to take which one as the reference point? Your glenoid force as the reference point, this one. So internal rotation means the glenoid fossa moves. This is the vertical plane. For example, if my body is the coronal plane, okay, frontal plane like this, you can see that the glenoid fossa moves anteromedially. This is the anterior direction. This forward movement is the anterior movement. And at the same time, it moves anteromedially also. But is why? Because it is a rotatory movement. If it is just moving anterior, it is just anterior movement. Protraction. Okay. But what happens here is that it also moves slightly medially. So internal rotation in the acromioclavicular joint is the movement of the glenoid fossa anterior and medially. That means anteromedially. And definitely the scapula clavicle is in, attached to the acromion process of the scapula. Definitely then the, if the glenoid fossa is moving, the acromion process also moves. So that is the joint movement. So glenoid fossa moves andromedially. That motion is known as acromioclavicular joint internal rotation. So if it, this is one, my glenoid fossa moves andromedially. So this is the movement of uh, an acromioclavicular joint anteromedial movement that is the acromioclavicular joint internal rotation. Okay. What then what about the external rotation or lateral rotation? The same thing. The glenoid fossa moves and posterolaterally. What is that? The glenoid fossa moves posterior and laterally. So the glenoid fossa moves posterolateral the movement of the acromioclavicular joint. It's very simple when you understand the reference point that is the glenoid fossa. Why the scapula is moving along with the movement of the clavicle? Can you tell me why the scapula is going to rotate internally or externally along with the movement of the scapula clavicle? That is because you know that our ribs are having a curvature and the scapula is not a anatomical means just a functional joint so along with the curvature of the ribs the scapula moves the scapula moves along with the curvature of the ribs that is why we need this movements so this movements help in always keeping the scapula in relation to the curvature of the ribs the anterior surface of the scapula is always kept in relation to the curvature of the ribs so when you are elevating this one moves upward along the curvature of the ribs it moves downward along the curvature this movement is smoothened or integrated with the help of this acromioclavicular joint on motion as well as the scapular thoracic which you will remember later which we'll study later so in a sense acromioclavicular joint motion in internal and external rotation happens in the vertical axis happens in the transverse plane and it is the reference point is the glenoid fossa glenoid fossa moves anteromedially the reference point is glenoid fossa it moves anteromedially the glenoid fossa moves posterolaterally that is known as the lateral rotation if you want you can remember this movements are done in such a way that the movement of the scapula occurs in relation to the movement of the thorax only if you want you can remember only if you want you just remember and finally you have to describe here what is the movement and finally you write down the range of motion that is 30 degree the range of motion is approximately 30 degree we have not have a great estimation it may be 20 to 30 degree or approximately it is taken to be as 30 degree 
So this is all about the internal and external rotation. You write down the axis, you evaluate the plane, you find out the movement, and we examine the what is the normal range of motion. Purely this sort of discussion will help you to remember this movements in the examination point of view or throughout your lifetime. Otherwise, if you study it like a paragraph, you are not going to remember it. And now the next movement is anterior and posterior tilting. Anterior and posterior tilting. What is that? A tilting or tipping movement. The same mechanism of understanding the plane axis or axis or plane, the movement and the range of motion. These are the four headings that we are going to evaluate. What will be the plane and what is the axis of this movement? Anterior and posterior tilting occur in the coronal axis. Which axis? Which axis it is? Anterior and posterior tilting occurs in the coronal axis. Remember, it's not a pure coronal axis. It is oblique. Coronal axis means the x-axis. So it is an oblique x-axis movement. The, it is an oblique x-axis movement therefore it will be in the sagittal plane sagittal plane not purely in the sagittal plane slightly away from the slight pure sagittal plane slightly away from the sagittal plane okay so the movement occurs in the coronal axis and the movement occurs in the coronal axis and the plane of the movement would be definitely if you remember this coronal axis it will be the sagittal plane okay how can you remember that uh, I just told you very easily it is a coronal axis. You remember the earlier movement which was the antro, uh, sorry, internal rotation, external rotation. It is similar to the internal rotation and external rotation that happens in your shoulder. So shoulder internal rotation, external rotation is in the vertical axis and the coronal and the transverse plane. So you can remember that. Similarly, anterior and posterior tilting, you can remember at the end of the story. How is that? Anterior tilting means the acromion process moves and forward. What is that? The acromion process moves forward. Okay. The acromion process moves forward. Whereas uh, the lower end. Okay. Or the inferior angle of the scapula moves backwards. Can you, can you imagine this one? This is the normal position. Let me just remove this clavicle because it's uh, the functionally it is uh, like the movement is happening in the acromion process and the glenoid fossa. So what happens in the anterior tilting is that the acromion process moves forward. When acromion is moving forward, you can see that the tip, the lateral, uh, the inferior angle of the scapula will move backward. So this is more known as the, for example, get an understanding this is known as the which movement anterior tilting or it is known as tipping movement anterior tilting or the tipping movement. if the acromion is moving forward definitely the glenoid fossa also moves forward okay so you take the glenoid fossa as the reference point or the acromion as the reference point it is better you uh, describe acromion and the inferior angle because these are both ends of this scapula so with the reference to the ends you can define it clearly so what is anterior tilting anterior tilting means the anterior acromion process moves forward inferior angle moves backward if you just say acromion moves forward it's not anterior tilting okay the inferior angle should move posteriorly so the acromion is moving post forward and the inferior angle moves backward that is known as the forward tilting movement or anterior tilting movement or anterior tipping and you can simply guess what is posterior tilting that is the acromion moves posteriorly and the inferior angle moves forward acromion moves backward inferior angle moves anteriorly so the inferior angle moves forward acromion moves posterior that is known as the posterior that is known as the posterior tilting or posterior tipping movement which movement can you equate this this is happening in the flexion extension plane this is happening in the flexion extension plane that is in the sagittal plane so if you remember in your mind this is happening in the flexion extension plane definitely you can simply tell it is in the coronal axis or in the x axis and remember always in acromioclavicular clavicular joint it's oblique just mention that oblique so you can correlate it that manner so this movement is the sagittal plane movement so you can simply tell it these movements are in the frontal plane and these movements are in the 
which plane transverse plane so planes and angles are very important concept with respect to your biomechanical studies in every single joint and the normal range of motion is approximately 20 degree what is that the normal range of motion is in approximately 20 degree these movements are also done so that the scapula is moving along with the thorax throughout the range of motion am i right okay now let us simply move on to the last movement of the acromioclavicular joint that is the upward and downward rotation what is that upward and downward rotation upward and downward rotation downward rotation so this is the last movement and here definitely you got the vertical axis that means you got the transverse plane you hit at the, the, this one you studied about the sagittal plane and definitely and finally you have just one movement that is the ap axis oblique ap axis it is that oblique ap axis and a frontal plane movement approximately a frontal plane movement so the axis of the joint is the oblique ap axis and the plane is frontal plane slightly away from the normal plane okay slightly away from that and what is the movement what is the movement what is the movement in upward rotation in upward rotation of this one acromioclavicular joint you again take your glenoid fossa as the reference point the glenoid fossa moves upward what is that the glenoid fossa moves upward what is the movement upward rotation so correlate with that this one is it clear so if the glenoid fossa is moving upward that is upward rotation so don't get confused in examination or when somebody asks you uh, what is that upward rotation oh definitely glenoid fossa will be moving upwards clear so the glenoid fossa moves upwards that is known as the which one the upward rotation what is happening when the glenoid fossa is moving upward can glenoid fossa alone move it has to move the tip it has to move the inferior angle so when glenoid fossa is moving upward the inferior angle is moving away from the midline of the body this is the midline of the body it is away from the midline of the body that is the inferior angle moves laterally am i right is it clear so this is the normal position this is the mid axis or the vertical line or the even the vertebra okay vertebral column now scapula is resting like this what happens in the upward rotation it will move like this that is a glenoid fossa move upwards at the same time your inferior angle moves laterally this is a midline so this side movement is the lateral side movement so in upward rotation the upward rotation it's upward rotation movement that is why you need this rotatory axis axial movement in this bone so in upward rotation the glenoid fossa moves upward whereas the inferior angle moves laterally that's all about that one and what about the uh, downward movement or downward rotation the glenoid fossa moves downward and the inferior angle moves medially the glenoid fossa down moves downwards and the inferior angle moves medially that is the downward rotation upward rotation normal range of motion is 30 degree whereas in downward rotation it is a 17 degree of course there is a lot of variations with this value so the upward rotation value is 30 degree downward rotation value is 17 degree so we studied the three movements in the acromioclavicular joint which are very simple if you take the holder joint as a whole or which you take the glenoid fossa as a reference point am i right the internal rotation and external rotation is the movement in which the glenoid fossa is moving andromedially and postolaterally upward rotation is the movement in which glenoid fossa moves upward and the lateral end inferior angle moves laterally downward rotation in glenoid fossa moves downward and inferior angle moves medially whereas anterior tilting you take the acromion process you define with respect to the acromion process the acromion process moves forward and this one acromion process moves backwards so that's all about the acromioclavicular joint movements and uh, with that we wind up the discussion on acromioclavicular joint and in next session we will be straight away going to the scapulothoracic joint of course it has no anatomical definition because it's a functional joint so we will just straight away move on to the scapulothoracic joint until then stay tuned and if you like this video don't forget to click the like button and kindly subscribe to our channel Turn on the bell icons so that you are updated with all the updates in our channel